fair housing laws and animals are primer for community associations. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and adjust, address them in real time during the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. And now I'd like to introduce Marla Diaz and Jeff Seaman. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to attend. Um, we are, we understand you're probably managers or perhaps board members of condominium associations or homeowners associations. And I want to present you a scenario to start out. And maybe it's one you've already experienced. You are sitting in your office or you're in the lobby. And an owner comes in. Somebody you recognize, perhaps they're relatively new, but you know who they are. You have a pet policy that says there are no there are no dogs in this building or in this community. And this person has a dog on a leash walking through the lobby. They wave and proceed towards the elevator. What do you do? And this is the question, this is the scenario that we are hopefully going to address you today. We'll be taking questions towards the end. Um, and I'm right now going to let Marla talk to you about the overarching sort of laws that apply here. And then we'll go a little bit deeper into the more specific laws that, that pertain to what you do about animals in a community association when you have somebody who claims or who is claims to do or who is disabled. Marla? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Jeff mentioned, um, our focus today is really going to be on animals and the fair housing laws and how they apply to animals in your community association. But it's always a good place to start with an overview of uh, those fair housing laws that apply to your community association. Um, there are three different areas of law that most community associations need to be aware of. All community associations are subject to the Federal Fair Housing Law, Fair Housing Act. They are then usually also subject to their own jurisdictions, fair housing laws. So in the District of Columbia, there is a human rights ordinance. In Maryland, there are fair housing laws. And in Virginia, there's the Virginia Fair Housing Laws. Additionally, you're going to be subject to your county or city human rights ordinances. And we've got listed here those for, for several jurisdictions in Maryland. But additionally, in Virginia, um, there are most counties and most cities have their own human rights ordinances. These human rights ordinances and the Fair Housing Laws and the Fair Housing Act are very, very common. They've got a lot of things. Um, that are identical about them, but there are some important differences so that when you are considering any sort of questions under the Fair Housing Act, um, you're going to want to be aware of each of these different scenarios that apply to your particular community association. Oftentimes there are procedural differences in how you have to handle things. Um, there are differences in how complaints are handled in the event a complaint is filed against you. And then sometimes there's some differences actually in, in the, the substantive law that applies against you. Um, one of the other the areas where this really comes to light has to do with those classes that are protected under the Fair Housing Act. So the big issue under all of these fair housing laws is the idea that we want to prevent discrimination in our community associations. And in order to do that, all of these statutes identify protected classes that the community association has to avoid discriminating against. Under the Federal Fair Housing Act, you have those protected classes that are listed and identified here, race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, and national origin. These apply across all jurisdictions, and all jurisdictions have these primary seven as the protected classes that they recognize. 
And most of these are, are fairly simple and easy to understand just from the face of it. But the one that's really most significant for our conversation today is the area of handicapped. When someone is making an application or is claiming that they are being discriminated against on the basis of their handicap, what does that mean? The definition that is provided um, is that a handicap is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of a person's major life activities. Um, this does not include in any jurisdiction, either Maryland, federal, DC, or Virginia, does not include someone who is using or addicted to a controlled substance. So um, to an individual that's trying to claim that they need some sort of accommodation by virtue of the fact that they have an addiction to an illicit drug, that person is not entitled to an accommodation on that basis. And the association is not prohibited from adopting rules that specifically restrict the use of any sort of illicit substance um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in their uh, community. Um, additionally, DC law specifically provides that a person that is an alcoholic cannot claim that as a disability um, where it would uh, impose or would pose a direct threat to the property or safety of others. So again, you're allowed to adopt restrictions and you're allowed to discriminate against somebody who is in their conduct because of their alcoholism, actually causing a direct threat to the property or safety of others. Um, one thing I do want to mention here, because I think it's pretty important when you're talking about protective classes is to be aware of the fact that one of the significant differences between the Federal Fair Housing Act and the various other jurisdictional laws on fair housing is the protected classes expand in many of those jurisdictions. Um, uh, DC, for example, identifies all of these additional protected classes that we have listed here are part of what they protect from discrimination. Age, marital status, personal appearance, sexual orientation, all of these here are part of that. Um, Virginia has been um, contemplating uh, legislation um, that would actually expand um, the category of uh, protected classes to include um, uh, sexual orientation. So um, that's something that various jurisdictions have expanded and it's something that everyone needs to be aware of. All right, I'm now going to turn it over at this point to Jeff to talk to you more generally about what community associations need to be worried about in terms of fair housing laws. Under the fair housing laws, thank you, Marla. Uh, and under all uh, disability uh, discrimination laws, there are there is a accommodation request and the modification request. We're mostly here to talk today about accommodation requests. Just briefly, modification requests are requests to affect some physical change in the unit or in the building that would enable someone with a handicap to better use the housing, to equal opportunity to use the housing, housing to put it specifically, something like a ramp or a handhold we're not really going to talk about that today, but uh, it, if it ever comes up now, you'll know the distinction between a reasonable accommodation request and a reasonable modification request. There are all the rules and regulations that apply, that apply in a situation, the one that described in the opening. And um, the, the rules and the regulations um, are all aimed at prohibiting discriminatory treatment of people with handicaps. And that's our aim today. We're going to talk about those in more detail. What a reasonable accommodation? That's the that's our point today. Well, it's, it might seem fairly obvious when you look at the law, um, but it has generated the question has generated quite a bit of litigation, lots of guidance from HUD, and and lots of discussions between attorneys and parties to litigation. Reasonable accommodation uh, must be reasonable, uh, must be necessary, and it must afford a disabled person an equal opportunity to use and enjoy housing. Uh, it's a multi-step analysis, so the first question is, is the person who is requesting this handicap? We're going to get to that in a minute, what that definition, the definition of that is and how you address that question. But here's an example. 
of something that might not be reasonable. Somebody who wants to use a golf cart in your condominium, that's obviously not reasonable. They may be disabled, they may have an obvious disability, but a golf cart is not going to be reasonable. Uh, someone who ha is hard of hearing and who would like to have a, uh, a base surround sound um, entertainment system in their unit that is otherwise prohibited in your building might not be a reasonable accommodation. It has to also be necessary. The person who's disabled, um, who's asking for the accommodation, uh, will have to, you'll, you'll have to be able to include that, that the requested accommodation is necessary to uh, assist them with that disability and to, you, to use accommodation to allow them to enjoy housing uh, equally. So an example uh, where a, an example I came up with was, is somebody who is, who cannot see, who is blind. And they ask for a transportation to and from the condominium. Well, that wouldn't be necessary to enable them to afford and use and enjoy the housing. So these are examples, hopefully, that you, you maybe you've uh, had to deal with this, but um, that's why we're here. If these issues come up, you can contact us. But the, the need for the um, accommodation is um, the issue and some examples of situations where people have requested accommodations that are found to be reasonable are, for instance, uh, this, uh, for example, a situation where some people who were had difficulty um, walking and who didn't want to walk a around the length of the building to get to the building from the parking lot. This is from Virginia. And they could be given keys to the side door of the building. The policy of the building was those were only for janitorial staff for security reasons. The court said that that was a reasonable request and it was necessary to allow them to use and enjoy housing. There are limits, um, some of which we've talked about, but as you can see here, these re requested accommodations shouldn't require um, the undue financial or administrative burdens or changes on a system or on a program that the community has in place. Um, when you respond to a request, you have to act quickly. And by quickly, uh, the guidance is usually about 10 days. You cannot let it sit. Um, you, you, you have to take action. And we understand that when you're dealing with boards uh, and who are volunteers, it can take a while to assemble and react. But one of the purposes of today's seminars to give you the tools so that you're able to do that relatively quickly. But every case is different, so they're not often easy. Unless you do have a, a, a reasonable amount of time you have to respond in. You also need to talk to the person making the request. You have to engage conversation, a back and forth. Sometimes it will be necessary. Sometimes it won't be. It will be very easy. Um, there are differences of opinion among the courts in the country about the, the extent to which this conversation has to occur, but in this area that is in the Fourth Circuit and in the District of Columbia, the federal courts have likened this to the conversation that's required under the ADA. So it's an iterative process. You're going back and forth trying to work it out, trying to accommodate this person if they are disabled. Now, one of the danger areas uh, that we've seen is how, how, how much can you ask for when someone says they're disabled? Well, the guidance that HUD provides and the, the decisions by the court provides and the CFR, that is the federal regulations provide, is that when a disability is readily apparent, you can't really dig too deep. You are limited. So what's readily apparent? Well, obviously, there are people who have difficulty walking, 
um, who cannot see. Then there are some that are maybe a little harder to tell, but that guidance, which was recently published in January, um, and, and we can provide copies if you, if you email us, uh, but it is very helpful and it clarifies a lot of the problems that have been uh, popping up on this question. But at HUD guidance uses examples, um, even some forms of autism could be considered to be non or rather observable disabilities. So you have to be careful, but um, there's a there's a line that you have to be concerned about when somebody says they have a disability. Sometimes there are non-observable disabilities, and uh, these are probably the ones that are most vexing. And the one that I used as an example in the opening, you can't ask um, about whether the person who's coming to you is applying to purchase or rent a unit. You can't ask about the nature or the severity of the disability. You can only ask about the, the bare minimum. For instance, uh, in DC, your inquiry has to be limited to the minimum information and documentation necessary to establish that the individual meets the definition of a person with a disability. That's sometimes tricky. And sometimes um, you might need to uh, check with somebody else about that and bounce it by somebody else. Uh, we're here for that. Um, but it is sometimes uh, an area where people get stuck. Um, there are uh, also situations where um, someone comes to you, like the, in the situation I described in the beginning, where you can't tell from looking at them, from speaking to them, that they are disabled. Um, <clears throat> if it's not readily apparent, uh, Marla wanted to explain to the panelists what you do in that situation. Sure. So um, we have been fortunate in the last um, uh, 12, 60 days that we've gotten some additional guidance from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is responsible for uh, adopting federal regulations related to the uh, enforcement and application of the Fair Housing Act. And they've re recently issued at the end of January some additional guidance on exactly this question, which is how does a uh, housing provider, such as a community association, um, uh, address the, re the request that they get for reasonable accommodation for animals, particularly when what you're dealing with is a disability that is not a readily apparent disability, not something that the association knows or should know about. Um, and what they have done is they've identified the kind of information and the kind of questions that a community association can ask. Um, an association is entitled to ask for information to verify a non-readily apparent disability. And you can seek that information from some sort of reliable third party. Uh, so oftentimes this will be an individual's treating healthcare provider or a licensed clinical social worker um, or someone who has some sort of, of opportunity to both treat the individual that is seeking the accommodation and to be able to opine as to the existence of a disability. The association is not allowed to request specific information about the nature and the severity of the disability that the individual is suffering from. Um, you can only ask whether or not they do in fact suffer for, from a condition that qualifies as a mental or physical disability that affects a major life activity. You can also ask the, the, that third party for information um, about the relationship or the nexus between that disability and the accommodation that is being requested. By way of example of this, um, I had a client who had an owner who suffered from what was actually a known disability. The individual suffered was, was blind and the individual was coming to the association and was seeking as an accommodation a reserved parking space 
in front of the the entrance to the building and obviously we had a we had a concern as to what was the relationship between the the fact that the individual couldn't see and their need for a parking space because as you can imagine we were very much hoping they were not driving uh, and so we entered into the dialogue that you are uh, encouraged to enter into with the individual we went back to them and they we said we need clarification from your third party as to what is the nature the, the nexus what's the relationship between your disability and the symptoms of your disability that we're trying to ameliorate to give you equal access to our community association and the uh, person came back and the information that they were able to provide is that their caretaker in order to be able to drive them to and from places and to then safely get them into the building didn't want to have to cross lanes of traffic with them particularly when they were carrying groceries and that sort of thing um, uh, and that as a safety concern they needed to be right by the sidewalk that went into into the building and so for that reason we had the information to understand that it was a reasonable necessary accommodation one of the things we've included in here is that the association needs to be very careful not to second guess the information that it is receiving from uh, an owner unless that information is very clearly fraudulent um, and the the reason for that is twofold one because an association is not in a position to make judgments about a person's disability and what is necessary for it we don't have the capabilities we don't have the knowledge and it's really not our expertise um, the other reason for it is this is there is a great deal of risk to community associations based off of these reasonable accommodation requests um, I, I recently did a program with um, an insurance broker who had statistics on um, the the percentage of increase of fair housing complaints that are being filed against community associations and they're they're growing very significantly and the area in which they're growing most significantly is this area right here is reasonable reasonable accommodation requests and um, uh, so there's a great deal of risk of a complaint and there's a great deal of a risk of that being a very expensive thing to defend. Um, if any of you have had an opportunity to deal with these, what, what you will come to discover very quickly is that the investigating entity, be it your state or local um, Fair Housing or Human Rights Commission, um, is going to investigate it to the nth degree it's going to take many months. It's going to require significant document requests and a great deal of legal work on your behalf. Um, and that's even if it gets dismissed at the end of the day. Um, if it does, in fact, get found that there's probable cause to believe there's discrimination and then a lawsuit is filed against the association, uh, the expenses are astronomical. So it's very important not for, associ for associations not to risk um an error on these questions and it's very important not to just guess that something's fraudulent or wrong but to in fact know it um, and one of the things i will say is that the recent guidance we got from hud did provide one very helpful piece of information which is this um, it discounted uh, the veracity of those internet certificates as some of you may know um, or have seen, there are several companies online that for 150 bucks and filling out a 20 question um, uh, multiple choice exam, uh, you can get your very own emotional support certificate. And HUD has said that standing alone, they don't believe these to be valid, which is, I think, very helpful guidance for, for community associations. Um, one other thing that um, Jeff had mentioned earlier that it's very important for an association to act promptly when responding to these requests, um, but it's also important not to put unreasonable promptness uh, requirements on an owner. So you can't say to someone who's requesting a reasonable accommodation, if we go back to you and need additional information, you have to get it to us in 30 days or we're going to deny the reasonable accommodation request. That's not an appropriate position to take in D.C. or in anywhere, but in D.C. it specifically has been identified as being against the law. So um, that's that's something that you all need to be aware of.
Um, one of the things that, that before I let Jeff start talking to you about service animals, we've had a couple questions come in and one of them I want to address at this point because it's a very overarching question about reasonable accommodations and the question is, um, do reasonable accommodations apply to HOA clubhouses and common ground areas and similarly do they apply to pool areas? And the answer to the question is, um, yes, the, the fair housing laws apply to all of the facilities of a community association. The question is going to be is whether for that particular request and that particular animal or whatever other accommodation request is being made, it's reasonable and necessary. And um, one of the things you're going to find out as we go through this is it's really critical for all reasonable accommodation requests is to take them on a case-by-case -case basis and not consider any one of them uh, standing alone. You know, we have a policy across the board. This is how we treat all requests for, uh, for emotional support animals. That can't be the way because there's going to be some circumstances where an owner has a unique set of needs and the association needs to be able to respond to those needs separately. So in some circumstances, it may be appropriate and it may be reasonable and necessary for it, for an owner to bring their animal, uh, their emotional support animal into the pool area. I think it's very unlikely and it's gonna require some exceptional need, but the association needs to be very careful not to have across the, the board rules and instead on a case by case basis, determine whether for that requester and that animal, it is reasonable and necessary for that animal to have access to all parts of the association. Um, but now I'm gonna let uh, Jeff talk to you about service animals. Thank you, Marla. It's interesting that there's a little bit of a difference between federal and state laws about what a service animal is in that federal laws, Federal Fair Housing Act specifically says that only a dog can be a service animal. And perhaps they've concluded at the federal level that only a dog capable of learning the sorts of tasks that are, uh, are necessary to assist people who are handicapped. But it really is not a, as important as a, a distinction as the fact that a service animal, whether it's in DC or Maryland or wherever, under the Federal Fair Housing Act or under local uh, laws is one that is trained to do a specific task, which task is on to assist a disabled person with that disability. That's the key. So for instance, here's the definition of the Fair Housing Act. As you can see, it's as said for uh, an animal that is individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of the individual with the disability. Uh, the law excludes other species, but there is room for all many other animals to serve as what's called a support animal. So there's the hierarchy, there are assistance animals generally, there are service animals as a sub, and what are often called support animals as another sub. But service animals, the difference is a service animal is specifically trained. A support animal need not be trained. Uh, Right now we're talking about what a service animal is. And as I said, in the District of Columbia and in Maryland, the definitions are different. Here is the definition of DC law, but it, it has that same key provision. It's one that is specially trained to assist the person with the disability. In DC and in Maryland, it can be a traditionally, uh, an animal's traditionally kept in the home. And I'll show you Maryland's in just a moment here. Here's Maryland's definition. Again, specially trained to assist a person with a disability. Maryland itemizes some certain, but not an, an exclusive list of tasks that that service animal can be trained to perform. Go back for a minute to the D slide, and you'll see here I have something called service animals in training. These uh, accommodations must also be permitted for persons who are training service animals and for those service animals themselves. We had a question uh, before we went on about whether the association or an association could require an animal to wear some indicia of its status as a service animal. 
there is not a requirement for that, and I don't believe could, you should try to do that for reasons we may go into in a little later. However, in the District of Columbia, there is a specific uh, requirement that the the animal where if it's an animal, a service animal training, that 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 animal uh, wear a harness, a backpack, or a vest that identifies it as a service animal in training. So, if somebody tells you they have service animal in training, you can require that. It's certainly in the District of Columbia. So I'm going to jump ahead here, and I was talking a moment ago about the difference between a service animal and a support animal. So the service animal is a trained animal. As Marla indicated earlier, you can ask for you can ask for some uh, explanation or demonstration of the training. And nexus between that task that animal performs and the disability the person has. Here we have, and this is probably the, the more difficult situation for management and board members. What if we have someone who says they have an emotional support animal? I can tell you, in the building where I've lived, I see people walking down the hall. And it is not, it's a non-dog building. They're walking down the hall with dogs on leashes. And I don't ask any questions, but um, I've heard from management in this particular building that these people all say have emotional support animals. He shakes it. He says it's very difficult. And it is. It's difficult. Um, but there are things that you can do. There are some inquiries you can make. Uh, Marla has touched on them. Uh, but the, the same sort of pattern applies when somebody it, wants to have an emotional support animal. Is have they shown have they shown uh, that they're in need of a reasonable accommodation? Again, here we we have talked about what an observable disability is, and most of the time, someone who's claiming that they need uh, a support animal that is an emotional support animal, the disability won't be easily observable. And here we go back to the the bases or the sort of verification of the need for this and the discussion that you have with somebody about that need. Uh, if that person has provided information that reasonably supports need, then you you should be prepared to allow the accommodation. Um, the HUD guidance again has cast a series out on the just internet uh, certification that uh, people have, maybe some of you have already seen. But there are other sources, for instance, that person's a physician or a counselor. Those, those notes from those people have worked and have been found to be, and we think you should conclude that they are satisfactory under, the, under those circumstances. Jeff, before you go on, we've had a couple questions. Yes on this topic that I want to address. Um, one of the questions that we got is, um, how many legal disabilities are there out there? Um, and I, I presume the question is from, from uh, disabilities that could qualify someone for needing a, a, an accommodation. And my response to that would be this. Um, there is, uh, there's not a, a specifically list of identified disabilities that could qualify someone for an accommodation. Um, it, any physical or mental condition that affects a major life activity could potentially be a, a justifiable reason for a reasonable accommodation. So um, it, it really can be anything. It could be a physical condition like as such as allergies, um, obesity can qualify as a legal disability if it has an impact on a major life activity. And then there are um, innumerable mental conditions. So um, there, there's really no specific list. And again, you're going to have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis to determine what is whether that disability um, has been documented, either something you know of or has been documented by a, uh, a someone with a, a third party with the expertise to do so, that it does in fact limit that person's um, major life activity in some way. Um, the, the next question, I thought this was kind of interesting, was a question, um, it's not specific to animals, it's actually specific to parking, but I think it goes to this accommodation idea. 
um, it, well, an important element of, of the first part of this slide here. The question is, how do you address a board member making a request for an accommodation on behalf of um, an owner who they just happened to see had a handicapped placard and I guess wanted to help them out. So they came back to the association, but the association themselves has never requested that accommodation. Um, it is a precursor that this is a, rea a reactive, reactive requirement for an association. We don't have to go out and look for accommodations. They have to come back to us. With, they have to actually make a request to us. And if they don't request it, then the association doesn't have an obligation to provide it. Um, the, the next question um, we've gotten was, um, what constitutes a major life activity? Um, and the list of major life activities that are provided um, in the guidance is very, um, uh, again, open-ended. So it talks about things like the ability to breathe, the ability to walk, the ability to, to um, uh, live without anxiety. Uh, so it, again, it's something significant about your, your life, and there's a lot of things that can qualify as a major life activity. So this is one of those things that if you have a question about it, if somebody's come to you with a request for an accommodation and you're not clear whether what they're talking about is in fact a major life activity, this is an opportunity to reach out to your legal counsel, um, or if you're on a board to your management to see if they have either any experience or can provide you with some guidance that's available in the case law about whether or not that is previously qualified as a major life activity. Um, the last question that really applies to this, uh, well, there's two more questions that I wanna address quickly on this slide, one of which is, um, uh, somebody who comes to you with a request for a support animal and they're, um, they're a short-term resident. They're coming to Ocean City just to rent for a week and they happen to have an emotional support animal. Um, and I've had this question too come up with guests. If it's a guest to the property that is, that is um, visiting one of your residents and they have an emotional support animal, does the association have an obligation to give them that accommodation? In both cases, the association has the same obligation to consider whether or not the animal is reasonable and necessary, but they also have the same obligation to give you an opportunity to respond to it that does need to be prompt. They can't just show up with the animal. They've got to give you some opportunity to take, to take a look at it. They have to give you documentation that is sufficient to demonstrate that it is in fact reasonable and necessary. And part of that is going to be, is it reasonable and necessary for the short visit that they're there? And it may be that it is, but if they give you that documentation, you're going to have the same obligation um, to provide it. Um, okay, um, the, the last question on this, sorry, Jeff, before I let you move on, the last question on this is, um, can a special assessment be made to the community to pay for an accommodation? Uh, and the answer to the question is yes. Um, if, if there is a cost associated with granted or granting a reasonable accommodation, unlike a reasonable modification, which the person requesting has to pay for, for a reasonable accommodation, which is, again, a, um, a change in a policy procedure service of the association, the association has to bear that cost. And to the extent that that cost um, is part of the common expenses of the association, yes, you're gonna to have to charge, you're gonna to have to pass that along to your other residents. All right, sorry, Jeff, I'll let you get going, keep going. Not at all, I, I put this in here because uh, I related to everyone I experience in buildings where I've been, and um, who, in a way, who wouldn't be emotionally supported by an animal like this, but, but the, <laughs> Some might disagree, but the point is there's a difference between a pet and an emotional support animal, and there is a requirement that, as we've been discussing, the people who are asserting that they need an emotional support animal uh, can be required to provide a basis for that. Um, there we go. So um, the support animals are can be lots of different kinds of animals, as we were talking about earlier. They can be fish, hamsters, rodent, birds. There are some limit on certain kinds of reptiles. If, if you have specific questions about reptiles, you can let us know. But uh, turtles are on the list. Um, they don't require any special training, as, as we said. You can, there are things that you can do. 
um, it's unfettered access. You can limit the support animals access to the common areas and common elements and Marla was talking about that in regard to pool and you can do the same with workout rooms, libraries, party rooms. Uh, there there are limits and you can require good behavior and Marlo I think has a interesting story about a case or two uh, where she had a bad be a poorly behaved animal that had to be dealt with but uh, you will have to give that animal a couple of chances to get it right in most cases. Marla, why don't you uh, relate that story for the audience? <laughs> sure. So um, I've had I've had a couple different associations that have had this problem. Um, my favorite, I think, was um, a condominium association that had granted a um, reasonable accommodation for a, a pit bull. Uh, and I will tell you off the top, I'm not one of those people that generally believes that pit bulls are bad dogs, but this one unfortunately was. Um, and she had not was not only poorly behaved, but she'd also figured out how to open the front door of the unit. And um, uh, she took that as an opportunity to go out into the hallway and unfortunately scare various residents. Uh, at one point, she actually chased a maintenance person into the closet um, trying trying to bite him. Um, she lunged at the front desk person, um, and she, at various times, lunged at other dogs, growled at other owners, that sort of thing. Um, and the association went back and attempted to address the situation with the owner by giving her an opportunity to get the dog into line. There were, she put the dog in some drugs, she tried to secure the front door of the unit, um, made certain that the dog was on a leash, such and so forth. And, and ultimately, however, there just wasn't any way to bring this dog into control. So the association was faced with the question of, do we, out of a need for the safety of the rest of our owners, need to, to ask the dog to leave the building? And um, if you've given them a reasonable opportunity to try to correct and they still can't correct that animal's conduct, then it is it may very well be necessary, unfortunately, to, to move them along. Um, uh, as, as a way to keep um, keep the rest of your residents safe. One of the questions that we've gotten today, Jeff, um, actually on this topic, um, really about limiting the animal's access to the common areas is a question that's been raised by our current um, COVID lockdown. And the question is with people that have very friendly dogs that are still trying to go up and greet everyone um, and who are sort of all over the place, um, does the association have any ability to try to limit that kind of behavior given the need for um, social distancing and making certain that we're not passing any, any germs? And then I think the follow-up question to that was, what, what about the, you know, what about these, these animals presenting some sort of increased risk to us um, as a result of, of the, the COVID-19? Um, and the first part of that, I would say, yes, the association does have the ability to adopt reasonable rules limiting an, an animal's access and conduct. So if you do have that owner with the very friendly dog, I think it's appropriate to reach out to them and say, at this time in particular, we're very sorry, you're going to have to keep the dog under control and you're going to have to prevent the dog from having contact with other people. We understand it's a very friendly dog. Uh, and normally we all want to give them all the pats in the world, but this isn't the time for that. Um, the other part of that is whether or not we can use this as a reason to completely prohibit um, animals. Um, and my position would be, again, notwithstanding the fact that, that we're dealing with this particular crisis, we don't have specific information that the that our pets are, are either um, spreading this or, or some additional risk to us beyond the, the risk we're all having to deal with right now. Uh, and until that comes to light, my position would be is assert the same social distancing requirements for the animals as you are for the humans. So encourage the six feet social distancing, encourage, encourage the regular cleaning and washing and separation that we're going to need to get through this safely. Uh, but I wouldn't use it as a basis to just across the board make any rejection of a reasonable accommodation request. Mark, we also have another question uh, that pertains to something we talked about earlier, and I'd like to address that. The question is, if a support animal was approved with an internet certificate, 
Can we now require they recertify the animal when we suspect there's no need for an accommodation? The HUD guidance addresses that. And the HUD guidance that, that we talked about that was published in January would say, no. um, it's not interactive in its operation, which leads me to a sort of a lawyerly, a short lawyerly speech about the difference between HUD guidance and court decisions. The guidance is not uh, necessarily the law is a strong indicator of what how it would be treated by the federal government or enforcement agencies. But there is a difference between the interpretation by HUD, for instance, or even Justice Department and publications that they've issued, well, the likes of which we've been talking about here today, and how a court might interpret it. So merely because it's the HUD guidance does not make it necessarily the law of the land, but it, it, it could be, as we said, very expensive to litigate the question. And each case is different. Every issue should be, every quest and issues like this ought to be addressed on a case-by-case basis. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that there are situations where courts, after usually lengthy litigation, have disagreed with uh, the agency's interpretation. However, as Marla indicated earlier, it can be very expensive to get to that point, and boards and management need to consider that closely as well. And when we get into situations that where it appears there's a quick call or there's room for interpretation, and there often is in these sorts of cases, and uh, we'll have that conversation. But I want to move on to the next slide here. Bear with me. And um, we were talking about the unusual animals. And the unusual animals um, present the requester, the requesting party, with a burden, a, a significant burden. Um, there is an example uh, that um, involves a monkey. And in this case, uh, this is a real case. The, the handicapped person approached the housing provider with a, I believe it was a reason monkey. And the monkey, he said, had been specially trained to help his, him his disability. And that disability involved the inability to use his arms and hands. So the monkey was specially trained to acquire, to, to get bottles of water and take the caps off and put a straw in the bottle so that it could have a drink of water. So that was a situation where the requester was able to show that the animal, even though it's unusual, was specifically trained and was uniquely able to perform the necessary task. A dog certainly couldn't do that. So that was an exception to the general rule that it is usually going to be an animal that's um, typically a household animal. There are um, difficulties that um, arise with uh, these unusual animals, and sometimes there can be, as we indicate here, uh, a, a reason for having an animal, not a dog, can be allergies to dogs. Uh, it, it occurs, and that has to be considered by the association or, or the community. Uh, there is a, um, there are often complica complications with these uh, sorts of animals, and you'll You'll hear about people with allergies. There are things that need to be worked out between the requesting party and the association and management. Uh, Marla, why don't you explain, uh, why don't you talk about the situation with allergies and no pet policies? Marla, I think we've lost the, we've lost the, uh, Marley, you maybe oh, need sorry, it. Guys. Sorry, guys. Oh, there you are. I'm here. Sorry about that. I have, uh, I, I have, as I'm sure everyone else is, I'm working with dogs right now. And they were being a little noisy. Um, <laughs> so I'm back. Um, so with regard to um, uh, neighbors with allergies, and this comes up often if you've got a building that is a no pet building, people will say, I moved here specifically because I suffer from this condition, this disability that affects my major life activity. I have bad allergies and uh, I can't live around animals. And then you get a request from a different owner who says, I need an emotional support animal, and how does the association resolve that problem? 
And the guidance that we have been given on this is that the association has to find a way to accommodate both disabilities, um, which is uh, a splitting of the baby that can require some fairly Herculean efforts on behalf of the association. Oftentimes it requires really creative solutions such as you find one entrance for the animals and one entrance for those with allergies. You provide increased filtration systems in your ventilation to prevent the transmission of the pet dander between the two units. Um, I've even had things where there's been a designated elevator, one elevator for animals, one elevator for people with allergies, and that you, that you enforce those rules in order to accommodate um, both the disabilities. One of the questions that we had come through was um, somebody said, what about somebody who said, I, I specifically moved into a building with a um, 30 pound pet limit because I have a fear of large dogs. And now somebody comes in with an emotional support animal who's an 80 pound Malamute uh, that I'm terrified of. What about the rights for the, of the rest of us? And um, again, the, the um, what the guidance is is that we have is we can't limit as long as the animal that the person is requesting is one of those common household animals we can't put a weight limit on it we can't say you need to get a smaller dog for your emotional support animal um uh so we can't if that animal is needed we still have to provide it it doesn't mean that we can't try to also find some sort of accommodation for that owner that has the fear of the animal to try to make sure that we keep them separated. We can require that the that the large Malamute is on a leash and under control at all times. When we, we can require them to use a separate entrance. We can try to limit in some way um, uh, their access so that we can we can prevent that sort of um, that sort of, of concern. Um, there was another question that was raised, which I think also goes to this complications issue. And the question was, can a homeowner who leases out their unit prohibit animals, even support animals? And the answer to the question is, in all likelihood, they probably can. Uh, it's really going to depend on whether or not they qualify as a housing provider, meaning typically that they rent more than three or four units, depending on the jurisdiction. Um, if they if they rent only one unit out, a lot of times they won't qualify as a housing provider and they'll be entitled to prohibit animals. But I will say this, it doesn't prevent the association from still having to grant the reasonable accommodation to its rules. So you can say to the person, we'll grant you the, the we've looked at your paperwork, we believe that you qualify for a reasonable accommodation from us, you'll have to deal with whatever your, your unit owners rules are by yourself. Um, and that's, I think, a very important thing to, to remember because that comes up um, in the case law, not only in terms of an individual unit owner's restrictions on their tenants, but also on the greater restrictions from county and state law. There's a great case out of Florida where the, um, the county had a prohibition on pit bulls. No one in the county was allowed to own or keep a pit bull. And someone came to the condominium association requesting a reasonable accommodation for their animal that was a pit bull. And the association denied it on the basis of the fact that the animal was in violation of the county law. And the court came back and said, no, 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 no. Your job is not to enforce the county restrictions. Your job is to grant a reasonable accommodation. And if they provide to you that that reasonable accommodation is necessary, reasonable and necessary, you have to grant it and then let the county enforce their own laws. So that's that's something that associations need to be bear in mind is what the, the scope of their brief is. It's to consider fair housing requests. It's not to enforce local laws. Um, animals at the pool is something that does come up. And again, as I mentioned at the top of the program, it can be, there can be occasions where you're going to need to provide um, a reasonable accommodation at the pool, but those are going to be limited circumstances and they're going to be special to that particular animal. Um, we talked about the registration of, of emotional support animals with the association. I don't have an objection to this, but you can't charge them a fee for it. So even if you have a pet fee that applies to all of your other animals, you're not going to apply it to your emotional support animal.
Um, Jeff, talk well, to you about I, Can I ask a question? I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah, sure. but can I ask a question about that? Uh, maintain a list of people who have um, emotional support animals or other support animals. Does, is, does that pose any kind of a, a risk at all for the association? I maintain? think the, the only risk that I would say is this, is if you are identifying the disability of the person or identifying it as a reasonable accommodation that you're making public, that would be the problem with it. Um, the, the, and what I mean by that is this, the association has a privacy obligation. You can't disclose that information you got and nor should you try to point a finger at the person who's gotten the reasonable accommodation. As Jeff mentioned earlier, we don't recommend a requirement that somebody wear a vest, that the dog, the dog wear a vest while in the common elements. Um, you're gonna just need to say to people, we understand this is a no pet building. We have certain obligations under the fair housing laws. We'll deal with violations as they as they appear. And that's the end of your comment on it. So um, while I don't mind the association keeping a registration of an emotional support animal as they do other animals in the building, again, you just don't want to point to the disability of your neighbors in any way, shape, or form. Um, we have talked about, and I'm going to move on to our next slide, we've talked a little bit about um, there's no obligation in the event that the animal poses some sort of direct threat that can't be reduced to an acceptable level. Um, but your standard pet rules are not going to apply to your, to your assistance animals. Um, and what I mean by that is this, you can have restrictions, as I said, on the part of the building that they enter. You can have restrictions on requiring them to be on a leash if it's needed. But there's going to be times where those rules are going to have to be disregarded if it's needed as part of the reasonable accommodation. So, for example, um, I had a situation where the um, owner suffered from PTSD. Uh, they had an emotional support animal who was specifically trained as part of their, their ameliorating the disability, which was that this owner was had gotten the PTSD while serving as a Marine who was going into very dangerous buildings first and having to clear dangerous people out of them. The dog was trained to go into all rooms before his owner and then come back out so the owner knew it was safe to go into that new room. That dog had to be off leash and it was trained to do so. So in those cases, sometimes you have to set aside your standard rules. And as I mentioned, you also have to make sure you're not charging any sort of deposits or fees. If the animal causes damage, you can then charge that damage against the owner, but you can't collect a deposit from it up front. Um, to sum up and sort of talk about what the, you all need to be thinking about in terms of your protecting your association on these issues, there's four things um, that you wanna do. The first of which is board training. You want to make certain that you have walked through these issues with your board and that they are comfortable and knowledgeable about how to handle these reasonable accommodation requests and why it's so important to get them right. One of the things you may also want to consider is the idea of adopting a reasonable accommodation and modification policy resolution. This is a resolution that just talks about the procedures of how someone submits their request to the association. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, because it, it gives your owners um, specific direction as to how to come to you. Now, they don't have to use this. There's no magic word that someone has to use in order to make a reasonable accommodation request. They don't have to say specifically that. They can say, I need an exception to a rule because I have this condition that should be a signal to everyone what, what I'm getting is a reasonable accommodation request. And that can come to any member of your board, any member of management, and the association is going to be responsible for handling it correctly, which is one of the reasons it's so important to train your board and your management as to how to identify these issues. But you can then direct them to this policy resolution. The other reason they're so very, very critical is because whenever you get a complaint, the first thing they ask for is whether or not you have one of these policy resolutions. And it's a way to start off on the right foot, indicating that you already are aware of and take these issues seriously. The next thing you want to think about are some insurance concerns. Um, 
you want to make sure that your association is appropriately def, uh, insured so that you will have a defense in the event that someone does file any of these complaints against you. And the last thing is <clears throat> use your legal counsel and use them early. We can usually help you out if we can get the question to us at the beginning, we can prevent you from having to have the complaints at the end of the day. And as we all know, prevention is cheaper than the cure. Um, so those are the big issues. I want to just make sure we've gotten all of your, your questions addressed, but I think we've, I think we've hit all of them uh, at this point. Um, so thank you all for um, your attendance today, and uh, I'll let Tracy wrap it up. Thank you, Marla and Jeff, and thanks for everyone for attending today's okay. webinar, Fair Housing and Animals, a Primer for Community Associations. After today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete it and provide your feedback. As mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. And on behalf of Whiteford, Taylor, and Preston, and our presenters, thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your day.